There's an old urban legend out there. Maybe you've heard of it. The DC-3's design was so good that you could take the engines off and use it as a glider. Well, not every urban legend is true, but this one is more real than you may think. I don't need to tell you that the DC-3 is one of the most versatile aircraft ever built. Almost every job in aviation has been thrown at this airframe at least once. So when it came to the US military needing a heavy lift glider in World War II, they came up with a crazy idea called the XCG-17. Towing gliders in World War II with the DC-3 wasn't just a little job it did, it was a monumental task and the airframe handled it very good. In fact, this airframe, LFR, when it was a C-47A with the Royal Air Force, towed gliders. In fact, WZS, ROD, DTD, 316, pretty much all the DC-3s we had towed gliders in World War II at some point in their life. But to learn why they decided to turn a DC-3 into a glider, we got to go and learn a little bit about the history of combat gliders in the U.S. The U.S. Army founded the official glider program in early 1941, based on the intel that the Germans successfully used combat gliders in Belgium. The gliders were given the designation XCG. Very quickly, the fourth model, which became the Waco CG-4, proved to be a successful design which even saw combat in the D-Day invasion. Even with a winning design, the progress did not stop as the Army was requesting larger and larger payload requirements. Models were becoming obsolete even before being test flown. The next winning design was the KCG-10A, being able to carry up to 10,000 pounds with a new larger rear door that can handle howitzers and medium trucks. 1,000 were ordered but were quickly cancelled due to further innovations. 1944 started off running with a batch of new designs, each trying to outtop the last in terms of performance, ending with one of my favorite designs, the XCG-16. This thing looks so cool, it looks like it's out of a black and white sci-fi movie. We now come to our hero. It is now June and we get the design idea that has no lineage to the ones before it. The DC-3 airframe was the basis for all military variant C-47s, including the XCG-17. It was amazing. Look, the airframe was already here. They didn't have to do any of the glider design, but one thing they really did was they had to lighten it up. In the C-47 days, there was navigators and radio operators. So this, all this stuff was removed and basically you can haul freight all the way to the captain's seat. Of course, the hydraulic system needed to be there for the landing gear, but no need for heaters, no need for any stuff that has to do with engines. All that stuff was thrown out. And on paper, it did really well. 15,000 pound payload, essentially doubling the payload of a DC-3. But why did they want it? Well, they actually wanted the DC-3 to be part of what's called a freight train. And not necessarily over in Europe, but in Asia, flying over the famous hump. Allied pilots in World War II coined the term the hump to describe the eastern end of the Himalayan mountains. They had the extreme task of flying their cargo aircraft over the world's tallest mountain range on a supply route that connected India to the Chinese war effort. The funny thing is the Curtis C-46 is more widely known for flying the hump due to its higher performance than a DC-3. And it goes to show us that the race to carry more weight was more important as the war drew on. Now let's get back to the glider. How did it do? We haven't seen very much info about it, so it must have been a failure. But that really is the furthest thing from the truth. The XGC-17 was actually easy to produce, as modifying an existing military C-47 was basically just stripping all the parts off, and it could even be done in the field. The payloads were higher than any other glider at the time, and even the test pilots reported excellent glide characteristics. So what happened? Well, there are two causes that seem to seal the fate of the XGC-17. One issue was the military's requirement for gliders to land on all types of terrain. That's why most gliders you see were low to the ground and use their bellies as much as seaplanes use their hull on water. The second biggest reason has to do with the DC-3's younger and much larger brother, the prototype DC-6 was being made at the time and the era of large cargo aircraft was born. 
With single aircraft hauling bigger payloads, the aerial freight train was basically obsolete and too risky. Plus, the war was coming to an end. Remember, the XGC-17 was being tested at the exact same time the D-Day invasion was happening. But even with all those reasons, that didn't stop them from trying one more time. A new XGC-17 was going to see some action, and they're going to try to break a world record. Nine months after World War II ended, the Naz Pierce was stripped of its engines and any unneeded equipment to test fly the aerial freight train one more time. It was also found in flight testing that using the military version of the DC-4, the C-54 was the best tow ship. So the mission was set and the C-54 towing the DC-3 glider took off on a grueling 11 hour flight covering almost 1800 miles from the Philippines to an airbase just outside of Tokyo. After this long flight it was toted as the world's longest glider mission over open water. And as you can guess if the aerial freight train concept did not catch on, the aircraft had its engines refitted and was returned to service as a normal C-47. So what happened to the original XCG-17? Well sometime in 1946 a company named Advanced Industries bought it, put engines back on, converted it to a DC-3C and like all good things it was last seen in Mexico in the 1980s. There's one more interesting mystery that I found. A lot of sources are saying that the original glider was a converted Airlines DC-3 pressed into service with the US military. But if you look at the production records and the serial number, it looks like that aircraft was always just a C-47. Another cool little point is the XCG category continued on and actually number 20 was actually the basis for the C-123 provider and the cargo door developed to what we see on the Hercules and C-17 Glowmaster. So the lineage of these airplanes continues to this day. One thing I want to point out is, you know, the DC-3 is not perfect. She is not without her faults. Matched up with today's modern airliners, a DC-3 doesn't even hold a chance. But think of it, folks, the DC-3 throughout the ages have found very intuitive ways to survive while other airplanes disappear the dc3 continues to fly so right now you could probably say i'm pretty biased in saying that dc3 is one of the best airplanes ever built and hopefully you are too uh, if you want to see more things that the dc3 has done like uh, flying with floats here or maybe even being turned into a bomber in world war ii check those videos out they're pretty fun too if you made it this far thank you for watching Hopefully you subscribed and we'll be seeing you in the next one. Bye.